I'm going to ask if a few of our of my people, just if I could get three or four people to uh, come up here. There's some journals right here, right here in this in these boxes. If I get a couple more adults to come up here and help with that. Terry, do you have the monitors off? Yep, all if you're if you are um, teenager and up, there should be plenty. Wants to bring me one also. I forgot to bring one up with me. These journals are going to be yours for the next thirty days, and you're going to use them for you're going to use them for your study and for your prayer life over the next thirty days. And just like our, this is this was our SBC president, um, Pastor Greer, uh, J.D. Greer, uh, just like he has challenged us to be praying for the one, we're specifically going to be praying for the one right now. So you're going to see in this journal, this is provided by uh, North American Mission Board, your cooperative dollars. And they were passed out to all churches, uh, participating churches in the cooperative program. Um, this spring, and so we kind of had time to set things up, and this is what we're doing now. So this is who's your one. This is how you're going to pray. It's going to walk you through each day how to pray for your one, your specific one. And why does the one matter? We see in the scriptures where Jesus talks about the one. He leaves the 99 because of his love to go chase after the one. He cares for the one. And while we look at big numbers and big things, we also must begin to care about the one because it's about a relationship with lost people. So in this journal, if you are a believer, I'm going to encourage you and challenge you over the next hour or so to be praying and asking God, who is my one? I'll tell you the first name of my one, and it is not somebody that I specifically want it to be, but God has laid on my heart. His name is Joe. Uh, he lives in our community, but it's not who you would, who most of you would think he is. But uh, Joe is my one that I'm going to be praying for, and that he's a difficult one to pray for. But I believe God has called all of us to, re to, to repent of our sins and to come to Christ. And so I'm going to be challenging you. We're going to pray in just a moment uh, that God would begin to lay that one on your heart. This is what I know. If there is a hundred people here this morning who are praying for one individual, and I believe God's going to have different people for each of us. Maybe there might be a few repeats, but that's all right. But in, the, in your life, praying for one person, 100 people praying for one person. I bet our church in total maybe has not prayed for 100 people in the last month. And so it's a challenge to you to be praying for one. You're not praying for our community. You're not praying for any of those things. You can if you would like to, but you're specifically going to be praying for the one. The one that God lays on your heart. And to begin to see what God can do. We've seen God work at Main Street when people begin to pray. And begin to pour their hearts out for lost people in our community. And we see them come. There's a couple of old ladies back in and when Main Street was in its old church. Began praying that God would send a revival. That God would begin to reach out to the lost in the community. And they prayed that it would start with them. And so they took the opportunity to pray. And some of you are here today because they prayed for you. A year ago, a year and a half ago, we began praying for people. We just had a list. We kept it quiet on Wednesday nights. It was just for our group. Begin to pray for the lost people in our community. We have seen individuals come to salvation. We've seen some of you come uh, to, 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 to be responsible and, and be a part of a church. And we've seen God respond to those things. So I hope that you don't neglect the idea and think that, oh, God could not save my one. But I pray that you and I encourage you to have passion and a consideration for the one that God would lay on your heart. And how you would be a part of, the, of ministering and to reaching out to them. So I want to take a minute. You can thumb through that, spend some time in it today. It starts today. We start wham bam right now as we pray for our one. But I want to specifically pray for you right now that God would give you that one person. Begin to lay on your heart and that you begin to lose sleep and that you begin to lose uh, your you would begin to give up time so that you can take the opportunity to minister and to share the gospel truth with that one that God lays on your heart. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you and we praise you for loving us, God. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to saving 
a grace th- through the blood of Jesus. And Father, we come right now, we ask that your spirit would fill us with the one. God, that you would just begin to speak into our hearts, who is that one? That you begin to give us courage and an ability. And there might be a little bit of a panic at first because the one might not look like what you want it, what we want it to look like. But God, we pray that you would give us a heart for those lost people in our community and across the globe. But God, we pray right now for our one. I pray that your church would receive the one, Father, that each individual here this morning, Lord, would, would receive that name, that you begin to lay it on their heart and begin to challenge them and begin to use them for your glory. God, we are trusting you for the one. God, I was once a one. Many in here were once ones. But people chose to pray for us and chose to pour into us. And God, we pray that we would do the same, that we would replicate just what others have done for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for loving us. In Christ's name, amen. At the end of the service, we are going to be, this is just kind of a heads up, going to be again praying for God to give you that name also and be praying, begin to just pray for that one maybe you already have on your heart right now. And so you're just going to have that opportunity to do that at your chair or at the altar with other people. You might not want to share your one, and that's completely okay. But you might want to tell others about who your one is. Maybe you can begin to pray together for that one as well. So I I just want to encourage you. You're going to be able to use this guide over the next 30 days and begin to see what God is going to do in our midst as we pray for the one. And so I, I want you to begin to ask God for that unthinkable, hard-to-get-along-with, drunk, drug addict, family person, whoever it may be. And I want you to begin praying for them. I believe that God does not move in, in a people until His people pray. Until their hearts are turned towards Him and that they see, begin to see the need in, in amongst their own people and across the globe. And I want you to have that as well. So we begin right now. Who is your one? I might ask very first of all, what comes to your mind? I've got three people and it's going to be fun. Actually four. What comes to mind when I say politician? Show the picture. Ha <laughs> ha. I was always a Bush family fan, and, and I, you know, you got that kiss the baby, and I think they're both screaming, let's get away from this. But what about when I say um, a CrossFit fanatic? That's the truth. CrossFit people always talk about CrossFit. For those of you who don't know what CrossFit is, it's this chaotic exercising routine. That's the best way to describe it. Lots of different variable things. But what about a millennial? And I am sorry, millennials, fellow millennials, um, but we're a funny group. This is a guy, and he says, Instagram is down. Just describe your lunch to me. Because you see those stupid posts. I'm sorry if you do it, but those stupid posts of what you're eating. I don't care. I really don't. I'm a millennial. I'm an older millennial, and I can guarantee you this. There's a difference between um, 30 35-year-old millennials and the new ones coming out, isn't there? Some of you are millennials. You know what I'm saying. There's a difference. But we all have stereotypical views of other people and what other people look like. And you have a perceived idea of what people groups look like and how they act and what they do. And I remember when I was a kid and found out that South Africa was mostly white because I always thought Africa was African, was black. I didn't even think about that or what it was possible. That's just an example. We apply our opinions and our views to the masses, though we only see a small portion of that population. So one more, what comes to mind when I say the word Christian? Go ahead and show the picture. Now, some of you younger ones are going to get this. You see who's on there. She held my hand in the prayer circle, so I guess you can say things are getting pretty serious. It's just a joke, okay? Have fun with it. 
But what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? Who do you think of? What does it look like to you? The broader culture forms opinions and impressions of what a Christian is and whether or not they are one. I mean, some think that Christians today are these gun-toting, alt-right group that has no heart for hurting an unwanted people. And true believers, we know that that's not the case at all. It's not me anyways. And at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his followers did not call themselves Christians even. That was a derogatory word used for them by those who were not even believers. In Acts 11.26, we see that the first Christians were known as disciples. It says, and when he had found them, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year that met with that a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. The word Christian is used only three times in the CSB and all of the scriptures, while the word disciple is used 281 times throughout the CSB Bible. And why is that even the case or the purpose? Because disciple is a better description of who we are and what it means to follow Jesus. And I'm going to give you an example. We're going to look at at our main text this morning and begin to see what a disciple is and what a disciple looks like. And so let's go to our main text, which is Matthew 4, 18, uh, beginning in 18 through 22. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, this is Jesus, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat with Zebedee, their father, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their mets, nets, and he called them. Well, I can't talk this morning. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I feel like we need some background of what's going on here to understand what is, what is the context this morning. All Hebrew boys went to Torah school at the age of five. So at the age of five, you went to Torah school. You began to understand and, and memorize the first five chapters of the Old Testament. By the age of ten, all boys knew the Torah and the best students They went on to study the remainder of the Old Testament. But those who didn't make the cut went home to find work and to help out their families and make a living. When you turned 17, if you wanted to make a career for yourself in religious studies, you you would go and you would search out a rabbi, a teacher, to apply to so that you could become one of his disciples, one of his followers, one of his imitators. And the rabbis, they could choose the smartest, most talented boys to, their, to be their disciples and to be who he wanted them to be. And so you got to pick. And they would sit down at his feet and he would choose them. And they would imitate him and begin to learn from him. For several years after being selected by the rabbi, the boy would follow the rabbi and imitate everything that he did in every way possible. You see, the goal of the disciples was to be just like the rabbi. But what occurred in our text this morning looks different than what normally took place. Something different happens with this rabbi, Jesus. You see, Jesus oftentimes does things differently. Did you know that? It's kind of contrary to popular belief or or, or systems But he does things differently. He loves people who we don't love. And he cares for us, even though we don't care for him sometimes. But he does things differently. You see, Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus, the new rabbi, chooses Peter and Andrew, who are fishermen. That means that they weren't the top of their class. They weren't the best. They didn't have it all together. Maybe not the smartest. You see, they were part of the B team. 
Now, I oftentimes have been part of the B team. When it came to basketball, uh, I, I just loathed gym class in high school. Just did not like it at all. And I was always one of the last ones picked, unless it was a, a hitting sport or a throwing sport, you know, like dodgeball, because uh, I, could, I could get them out pretty good. And, um, uh, and then, like wrestling, I was good at, so I could do that kind of thing. But when it came to basketball, mm, just didn't work very well. Definitely the B team or C team. But they had not made this religious cut. They were not the best of the best, and and I want you to sink in that I want that to sink in with you for just a moment. When Jesus is picking his team, he doesn't pick the A team, but instead the B team. The rabbi had chosen them, but he had chosen them with a purpose and a reason. The rabbi had chosen them and they had followed. They did not have political clout or personal power. Instead, they were willing to follow this rabbi that had chosen them. John MacArthur says, God skipped all the wise of the day. The great scholars were in Egypt. The great library was in Alexandria. The great philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were in Rome. He passed over Herodotus, the historian, and Socrates, the great thinker, and Julius Caesar. He chose men so ordinary that it was comical. No rabbis, no teachers, no religious experts. He chose people that you and I wouldn't choose to be on our team. But I believe that Jesus chose the B team because his work would not come from their abilities for him, but what he would do through them. They did not, Jesus did not choose them because of what they could do. He chose them of what he could do through them. You see, that's the beauty of our rabbi, our Jesus, is that he chooses us and works through us. He doesn't choose the A-team all the time. He chooses those who are willing to allow him to work through through them. You see, people with a lot of talent and ability would only get in the way because they would never learn to lean on his power. We know that Jesus taught his power in the weak. He taught that his power in the weakest vessel was infinitely greater than the greater talent without him. And I believe that God wants to use you and your family and at your workplace and in the people and the circle that you enter are a part of right now. And that he has a purpose and a reason for using you, not because of your abilities for him or the works that you have accomplished on your own behalf, but instead because you are willing to allow him to use you. We must simply be available. I do think it is time that we stop making excuses that you are not able to share Jesus, that he doesn't need your ability. He requires only your availability. Second, He chose us, not us, Him. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's His call out to these fishermen. Most of them probably stunk. I know when when I was uh, in the Philippines, there was fish and they would just lay them on the street. There would be a, a little table at a corner and they would just lay fish out on that table. And so you you really needed to go buy it first thing in the morning because in the afternoon it just it just had a different smell to it, okay? And, and fishermen, they just don't always smell the best when they come in. And so these men were not the A team. They were the they they were the hardworking, just good old boy kind of blue collar people. But Jesus chooses them. And while usually they would choose the rabbi, sit at his feet, and then the rabbi would choose him, Jesus takes it further back and he chooses us before we are ever looking for him. Jesus chose you while he was on the cross. He chooses us before we are ever looking for him. 
Scripture says that before the foundations of the earth, He chose us. And Jesus comes seeking you before you ever sit at His feet. The power of the Spirit is to come and call us to a relationship with Him. It calls first and we respond. Some of you are struggling right now in your marriage, in your career, in your parenting, and possibly even your health. And it's easy to get worn down, but we must believe this. If you are a disciple of Jesus, then He has chosen you. You know, suicide runs so rampantly in our culture today. It's just out of hand. And it's all most of the time because no one they feel like no one cares about them, that their situation is unfixable, and it's just not any other options. But to know that someone chose you, I mean, the hope in that is fantastic, isn't it? That, that He chose you and I. It's not just a happenstance. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give it to you. Thirdly, our primary calling is to be with Him. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Do you notice in our text this morning that He doesn't tell them where they are going or what they will be doing other than fishing for men? His primary call is not to do something, but is instead it is to become like Him. To follow Him is to imitate what He does. Remember the the, the student listens to the rabbi and, and does what he does and imitates what he is capable of doing. But you see, to become more like him, you must begin to know him. And to know him, you have to know his word. At Main Street, you have a lot of opportunities to do things just like this. Worship on Sunday mornings, Sunday school classes, small groups, Wednesday night prayer meetings, special studies. You have the opportunity to know Him and to get to know Him and to have more of a relationship with Him. And if you and I are really serious about being His disciple, will you be wise to take advantage of some of those things on a regular basis? But it takes time and effort to get the Word of God in us and for it to be stronger than what the world attempts to put into us. It takes time and effort. I've really tried to get serious about taking care of my weight. My doctor said, it's got to get rid of it. And, And so it's not, you can't just sit there and say, and read magazines about healthy things and healthy lifestyles. And then not apply what those things say. It just doesn't work that way, does it? Christians, we can't do the same thing. We can't say, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but, but I've, I don't open God's Word on any regular basis. I don't try to fellowship with other Christians. I don't try to join in in what God's doing in the mission field. But instead, you just, you just put it back. He wants you to be involved. He's calling us to be with Him. Fourthly, to follow Him, we have to leave all. That's everything. It says, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Him. Why was it so important for the Bible to give these two specific things? Very first of all, the boat is our careers. That was the way they made money and provided for their family. It's the way you take care of ourselves. We take care of ourselves. The Father represents the most significant relationships that you have. You might not have a good relationship with your dad, but there is somebody that you have a relationship with that you care about. And so it represents the most important of relationships, most significant relationships. To follow Jesus, he has to take precedence over both of those things. 
We see it in the Scripture. And I understand how difficult it is in our society at times, but oftentimes that's just an excuse that we can't share Christ with our coworkers. Most of the time that's just an excuse. But to follow Jesus, he has to take precedence over both of those things in our lives. Most of you will not lose your parents or your spouse even because of Jesus. Some may. For some, God may tell you to change careers. And possibly God is calling you to missions even right now. But the question is, are you willing to give up your career, your aspirations to go wherever he sends you? and Whatever he may ask you to do. You see, for most, it won't be that dramatic. I understand that. I understand that. Maybe you right where you're working is right where God would have you. And that is the mission field that he has placed you in. But for some of you, maybe God is calling you to something different. You see, there will be times that you will have to decide what comes first. The things of this world or the things of the kingdom of God. Which one is first for you? Fifthly, he commands us to spiritually reproduce. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Following Jesus means you make everything in your life under his lordship. It means that you walk away from everything that he has forbidden and seek what he has prescribed. Just as Jesus was a fisher of men, so must the disciples be fishers of men. And you and I, if we are going to call ourselves disciples, we must imitate him, Jesus Christ, the one that we are imitating or that we are following as his disciple. And to do that, we must reproduce other believers. This is one of the most essential parts of being a disciple. It is not something that is left to only a few of us. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you must reproduce spiritually. And maybe we should ask ourselves this question, how do you prove you're a disciple? Scripture tells us that it is by bearing fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, you have great cause to be concerned. Possibly you're not the disciple you thought you were. John 15, 8 tells us, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. How more clearly can it be put? That you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Now I understand that someone can proclaim Christ, on their deathbed and never have the opportunity. Or someone who proclaims Christ and they walk out the door and they fall over and are gone. But Scripture says that we are to bear fruit. What else does He say about bearing fruit? Jesus tells us that He prunes the what? The branches who don't bear fruit. That's an interesting thing. why does he prune them? Why do you prune vines? So that they reproduce, right? It's almost like disciplining them. You trim them so that other parts, the the healthy parts, are able to bear fruit. The next question you have is, how do I even bear fruit? Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus summarized his ministry in Luke 19 by saying, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. If we are his disciples, that is how we will summarize our lives as well. In his book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, Robert Coleman said, When will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. 
nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers do this job. Individual women and men are God's method. God's plan for discipleship is not something, but is someone. I believe that you are God's method for reaching the communities we live in and the world that we live in. Over the next 30 days, I'm going to ask that you commit to being that method that God has set aside for His purpose and plan. I encourage you to remember that as you pray for the person you have written down, or that you will write down, it is not on your own account or by your own means that they are to come to salvation. But it is the Spirit of God that calls them, pleading with them to come and follow me. You are the fisherman of the Bible. Take up your pole and watch what God can do with worms like you and me. Take up your pole and see what God can do with us. Through us. I'm going to ask them to begin to come on up here and play as we get ready for our invitation. As they're coming up here, I want to challenge you right now to write down that man or woman that God has laid on your heart for salvation. Now, I'm not asking you to pray for someone who is actively involved in their church. It's good to pray for each other. Don't get me wrong on here. But we're going to specifically spend the next 30 days praying for lost people. It's not that we're not neglecting someone else, but we are specifically going to focus on one. And so I want to encourage you right now as you take out your journal that if God has laid that one on your heart that you would write that down. And maybe, maybe you don't have a one yet, but I pray that you would open it up to day one and just begin to pray that God would give you the name of a lost person. My senior adults, I know some of you just, you're not around lost people very much. I understand that. But I just want to encourage you to, to begin to pray for your family members who may be lost. And if you don't know anyone who's lost, go visit Hotspot. Go sit at the Dollar General. And begin to see how broken our world truly is. Some of you may want to come up to the altar and begin right now pleading before God to draw in that soul. If God so chooses to call you to do that, I'm just going to ask that you would just come and pray once you write down your one. Begin to pray for that one person. I truly believe that when God's people fall on their knees and pray, He hears us and He responds. And he works through us and uses us to reach the one. Imagine if God used a hundred people today in the next 30 days to reach a hundred people. Can you imagine the impact that would have on our community? See, that's how reproducing begins because those 200 begin to pray for another one. And eventually, that's how the gospel spread, wasn't it? One by one, sharing the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we come right now before you and we lift up our one. Lord, we ask that you would give us a heart and a desire to see that one come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Father, help us to put all of the barriers aside, all of the excuses, all of, all of those things that we have tried to just put in in front of us so that we didn't have to do this. But Lord, help us to lay him aside and help us to begin to pray for that one. That is something each and every one of us disciples here today can begin to do is pray. No matter our health situation or our ability to get around and to do work and those things, we can pray. And Father, I pray that your people, that your people, O oh God, would begin to pray for the lost souls around us. And God, we are trusting that you will hear our prayers and that your glory will be proclaimed. 
And God, that people will come to salvation in you. Father, we ask during this time of invitation that your people would respond. That we begin to pray for our one. Lord, bless this time, for it's in Christ's name. Amen.